Who is this guy with the shark skin hair that's been wandering around <laughs> yesterday? Um, I did my medical degree in Queensland and became a fellow of the College of General Practitioners. Um, and because I have an interest in HIV and sexual health, I became an S100 HIV prescriber. I'll explain what that is later on in the presentation. Um, I also developed an interest in doing general practice-based research and therefore became the clinical lead in research at the practice. Um, we were the only uh, general practice site in Queensland to have the Gemini and Kango studies, which are the two BR studies uh, that were run recently. And I've also recently developed an interest in education of my peers. I speak for um, ASHEN to general GPs about HIV, PrEP, PEP, Hep C, um, and I organize meetings for other S100s uh, led by specialists, small group case based discussions. Um, so what is a wholesome house? We are first and foremost a general practice, what we call family medicine practice here. Um, but every practice has an interest in HIV and sexual health. Uh, there are three locations in Brisbane where I'm from, um, Byron Bay which is northern New South Wales and Sydney. Um, across our sites uh, there are about 2,000 PLHIV that attend for their care. Uh, I would say 99% of that is full HIV care at our sites. In Brisbane, we have about 477 patients that come to our practice. So we're considered a high caseload practice now. I know maybe in Asian numbers, that's not huge. Um, I was at an APAC, the Asia Pacific meeting with, uh, a couple of years ago and I was talking to a Chinese physician and I said, oh, we've got you know, this number of patients. And he goes, well, I've got 9,000. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> Um, the next section I'm going to speak about is, is the model of care that we have in Australia. Um, in 2009, what was then known as the Australasian Sexual uh, Society for HIV Medicine and the National Association for People Living with HIV uh, cre created this report which was on the models of access and clinical service delivery. And they described the different kinds of models that exist, um, either in a public or private hospital, a sexual health clinic at a private HIV S100 prescribing GP practice. And they say in a combination of these settings. So back in 2009, I don't think the shared care model was quite firmly in people's minds yet. Because in 2005, ASHAM, which is now known as the Australasian Society for HIV, Viral Hepatitis and Sexual Health Medicine, um, put out this document, which is the HIV Shared Care GP Management Plan Guide. Um, and they show a better representation of what the model of care can be. Um, at the base is the general, general, general practitioner. Um, who should be able to diagnose and basic, do basic evaluation for HIV? In the middle is the shared care GP, which is a GP who's done a little bit of training, but is um, sharing care with a HIV specialist, whether that's an S100 GP or a specialist in a hospital setting or sexual health setting. And the top bit of the triangle, which is where I am, is an S100 GP where we assume full care. We can initiate, we can monitor, we can prescribe, um, and when we come to difficult scenarios, then we liaise with our colleagues to get advice um, about what's next. Um, in 2012, uh, Newman et al. put out this paper called The Role of the General Practitioner in the Australian Approach to HIV Care. I'm going to read out that quote um, because I think it's important. And what they refer to is their discussions or interviews with senior professionals um, who felt that the strength of the role of the GP in the Australian Approach to HIV Care um, were described as their community setting the collaborative partnership with other medical and health professionals and a focus on patient needs. So I believe firmly that general practice is the ideal setting and the specialty to manage and coordinate care for PLHIV. With appropriate training, support and resources, GPs can manage HIV and comorbidities, many of which are already familiar to GPs anyway. Um, this graph comes from HIV Futures 9, which is a study of uh, the quality of life among people living with HIV. And what it shows is as our population ages, as our corporate ages, and this is not something that's new to I think everyone here in the room, but the number of reported comorbidities increase. I think there's a laser pointer from here. 
So from the top bar, um, under 35, large percentage of um, PLHIV report no other comorbidities other than HIV and mental health perhaps. And as they age, that figure drops. And you see increasing numbers of comorbidities, so one, two, and three. Um, when you ask PLHIV what health conditions they um, have other than HIV, I hope you can read this, maybe down the back you can't, I'm sorry for that. Um, these are the 13 conditions that were asked in the survey, which covered loosely gathered into systems, cardiovascular, respiratory, um, cancer, uh, arthritis, and neurological conditions. You can see that there are a lot of conditions that PLHIV have as comorbidities as they age. When you look at conditions for which medication is taken, the top two are cardiovascular, blood pressure and cardiovascular. Then you have respiratory disease down here, which is mainly smoking related. And then you have the scattering of other conditions. Um, when you then go to the Australian HIV observational database, or what we call the AHOT um, database, the report in 2018 shows that the proportion of AIDS and non-AIDS related deaths have been changing. So the grey shaded areas are AIDS related deaths, which has been decreasing. The last column looks a little bit uh, out of kilter, uh, not reducing, but that is actually a longer period than the other bars. Um, and the black bars show non-AIDS related deaths have been increasing. Um, when you then look at the cause of death, um, cancer comes in at number one. And then when you combine MI or other ischemic heart disease and other heart or vascular disease, that comes in as the second most uh, reported cause of death from a single system. So these are conditions that GPs look after. You know, that list of conditions that you have, we do this every day, whether the patient has HIV or not. So I think, you know, um, having a GP lead a HIV um, care model provides equity of access. Everyone has access to a GP, I believe. Um, it provides holistic care. We view the, pe the person, uh, not just the disease, and we can focus on key populations. So my practice has a focus on MSM, but there are other clinics in Brisbane that have a focus on PWID. There are other ones that um, focus on sexual health HIV, but with a GP-led model. The next section is what happens when you give GPs the ability to care for PLHIV. Um, HIV Futures 9 has been a study that's been going just over 20 years now, and it looks at the quality of life uh, among PLHIV in Australia. This table asks the participants what their source of main HIV-related treatment is. Um, the, the second line, like the same doctor I see for general medical treatment, so these are S100 GPs, 37.4%, and then a different doctor. So some PLHIV know that their GPs are S100 prescribers, that we can treat HIV, and I think this other GP column includes or falls into that section because some, we, don't, we don't make a big point that we're S100s, we just treat HIV. When you add those percentages together, just under 50% of PLHIV in Australia are looked after by GPs, primarily. When you look at this data that comes from AHOD, now the numbers are a bit small, uh, but this is the most recent report from AHOD looking at viral load suppression, coming with data coming from sexual health clinics and high case load general practice clinics. In 2017, the bottom figure here is 97% of gay and bisexual men who are positive are suppressed. Um, if you look at the AHOT data, it's about 96%. So we're doing quite well, I think, in uh, managing HIV. This is, you probably know this figure, this is the Care Cascade in Australia, put out by the Covey Institute. The numbers are a bit small, so I managed to find this, which was put out by the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations. Um, in Australia, 89% of people living with HIV are aware of the status. 87% of those people diagnosed are receiving treatment, and 95% of those, 95 of those um, have undetectable viral load. 
50% of these patients are looked after by GPs primarily, full HIV care. Um, the worrying thing in the graphic is that when you look at all these numbers, there's still 26% of people without a suppressed viral load. So there's still an issue to be addressed in Australia. Um, but we're focusing on GP care. Um, how does it work? Every GP, I believe, should be aware of and screen appropriately for HIV in key populations. Every single GP. And I think that happens here in Malaysia from what I understand. Um, there is HIV education in general practice training or in basic medical training. I also think that every GP should be able to prescribe PrEP to every population. So in Australia, you probably know that we have universal access. Every GP can prescribe. Um, we still have trouble with some GPs who are not comfortable, uh, who worry that they haven't got enough knowledge to do it. So the um, MSM friendly practices tend to do the majority of prep prescribing, but more and more GPs are taking that on. And part of our role as S100 GPs to do a lot of prep prescribing is to try and educate our colleagues and peers that it's not difficult. You just have to know the um, guidelines and what you need to do. The next level of GP care, again, I'm, I'm sorry for this slide, it's a uh, very small print, but for the GPs in that middle band who want to do shared care, they might have a few patients, but they don't want to assume full care. There is a program for shared care training for GPs run by ASHAM. There's three levels of um, training. You can do an online module. You can then follow it up with face-to-face. -face. There is also an RCGP audit that you can do as part of that training to get points but that will set you up to participate in shared care with a HIV treating doctor. This is what I went through to become an HIV S100 community prescriber. So in Australia, HIV drugs are uh, classed as a section 100 highly specialized drug. So not every GP can prescribe it. Um, you have to be accredited and you have to uh, have continuing CPD or CPD to continue prescribed. Uh, but I think the important um, part of this slide is the last sentence which says community <laughs> prescribers provide important care options for people living with HIV by allowing them to seek the HIV care in a general practice setting. Um, how do we do this? There's three parts to the training. Um, ASHAM runs an introduction to HIV care online course. There is then a HIV S100 prescriber course and assessments. And then there's CPD to maintain the accreditation. The accreditation. We have one body that uh, maintains the HIV community prescriber programs for all the states and territories except in Victoria, which is done in partnership. This is the module on HIV care. Um, it's the introduction to HIV care, and it covers uh, the following sections. Could it be HIV? So considering HIV in your differential list, it covers HIV testing, what the results mean, how do you give the results, uh, counseling, there's an introduction to HIV treatment at the basic level, and then there's monitoring and shared care. This is also the same module that's used for shared care GPs. If GPs who have done this course or who actually came into the program to do the full S100, oh, sorry, um, I've, I've learned recently that in Malaysia there is a course called HIV Connect. Did you guys? Yes. Heard of it? Yeah. So uh, this is very similar to what we do, the, the slide before, the introduction to HIV care. I think it goes a little bit beyond that too. Um, now this was uh, created by Masham, um, MAC and MAP, correct? Uh, the Academy of Family Physicians and Medical, uh, Malaysia Medical Association. Um, so a collaborative effort, which is great, I think, and recognizing that HIV care can be done in general practice. Um, I think the course goes a little bit more than what the introduction ASHAM course does. Uh, there's a primer on HIV, which covers the basics in HIV, and then there's prevention, uh, PrEP and PEP, and then the third section is on STIs. Um, The next part of the S100 program, if you want to become a prescriber, is to do a face-to-face -face course. Now that runs for two days and includes the following topics. Um, how to initiate ARV, uh, looking at uh, principles, drug classes, and initiation, how to monitor the patient and therapy, screening for other infections, how frequently do you monitor patients, 
uh, how do you address adherence issues and test results, Toxi toxicities and adverse events, special scenarios, and then there's clinical skills development. Once you've gone through that program, there is an assessment. So unfortunately, there is a test. It is done online, um, but once you complete that assessment, then you uh, can be accredited and registered with the states uh, to prescribe S100, um, S100 drugs. Once you complete that course, you're not thrown in the deep end. It's not sink or swim because part of the program has a men mentoring component. So for the first 12 months following accreditation, um, new prescribers are required to demonstrate their relationship with a mentor. Um, a mentor is just someone that's more senior, more experienced, that's willing to be your first source of contact if you have any questions. Um, there is a requirement that there is a minimum of four contact within the first 12 months. It can be anything, a discussion at a meeting, a phone call, an email, uh, and, and these are the areas that they seek to uh, see that there's been mentoring in, uh, new diagnosis, treatment change, uh, changing regimens, uh, if there's suspic suspicious um, reactions that might be adverse reactions or potential drug interactions. Um, so for, for, patient, for a prescriber in a high case of a practice like myself, it's quite easy to meet these mentoring uh, conditions because there's other GPs that do the same work that I do. Um, for prescribers that uh, have no current caseload or only have a, a handful, um, is that 15 minutes? No. no. <laughs> um, there is a requirement that there is contact every three months. Um, now, how do you maintain your accreditation? Uh, CPD points, which I believe for general practitioners are starting next year in Malaysia. It's every year. It's every year. <laughs> I think, is, is it correct that in the public system you have their own CPD but not the private? It's ongoing. It's, it's ongoing, okay. Um, we have to approve a minimum seven HIV CPD points per year. Um, they can come from um, uh, lots of scenarios, so clinical updates, clinical mentoring, uh, clinical placement, audits, attending a conference like this, um, or online activities. Um, if there is an external provider, so if you remember I said I'm interested in education um, events, um, I can submit our meetings to ASHAM to be adjudicated, I think we told her there's three minutes, um, for, for points. Um, I can brush through these. These are resources that um, ASHAM puts out. Uh, this is decision making in HIV for general GPs, uh, covering things like could it be HIV, um, informed consent and testing, and how do you convey test results. Um, further uh, referrals, treatments, and then monitoring. Um, this next resource is, is new, as of two weeks ago. I don't think it's been officially launched. You guys are the first people anywhere else in the world to see it. Um, it's the HIV monitoring tool, which is a guide for um, S100 GPs as to how you monitor a new patient. So going from history, examination, assessment, to planning. And that's a checklist of what you do and how often you do it. The, the print is tiny. One of the things that I've done is put um, uh, web links on the uh, slides, so you can go and have a look at them. You can download this, this is open access, you don't need a sign in or a password to get this. Um, and this is the page from Ashton about the HIV prescriber program, if you wish to go and have a look at the different links. The resources for HIV prescribers, um, the third box from the left is uh, where all the resources are listed. Um, I find this very helpful as well. So the Alfred, which is a hospital in Melbourne, um, their specialists were worried about how they were going to manage comorbidities. So they got all their other specialists together to come up with a list of things that they felt were important, such as cholesterol management, hypertension, diabetes, um, renal and renal liver health, bone health, STI management. And if you go to that link and click on, the, on those areas, you come to flow diagrams as to how you should screen, how you should monitor, what you should do, how, when you should refer. Um, I find that helpful from time to time, but because I do it day in, day out, I don't often go to that resource. Um, will it work in Southeast Asia? I couldn't look at every single country in Southeast Asia, so I focus on Malaysia. Um, I think one of the key issues is that we need um, key populations 
uh, input in, in uh, GP-led care, um, is it accepted? Will it be accepted? Is it something that they wish to participate in? Um, I'm talking with some people um, here tonight about uh, how we manage or support that model, and, and one of the ideas is do we have, should we do a survey of PLHIV to see is this something that they want? Um, there should be a national policy of political will, um, and I'm glad to see that the Malaysian National Strategic Plan to End AIDS actually talks about uh, moving HIV care into the community setting. Um, you need the infrastructure. Now, I'm led to understand that the clinic is the which are led by family physicians, um, are able to look after HIV patients, um, but the private model is something that needs to be looked at and worked on. Um, in talking to Dr. Yap, Andrew, I don't know if he's here today, um, he's a GP that does um, HIV care, is involved in education as well from the Red Bay. Um, the identification and recruitment of GPs that wish to do this sort of medicine has been proving difficult. Um, training and accreditation, you have HIV Connect, um, you have the Malaysian Consensus Guidelines and HIV Management. Um, prescribing, I think, is a big issue here for GP-led care. I can prescribe. People with HIV in Australia can go to any pharmacy in the community and be dispensed their medications. We're very lucky. Every time I go to a meeting, um, I hear about the difficulties from other countries about prescribing and cost of drugs. To patients in Australia, that is a subsidised program. Um, so cost is often not an issue. Um, but I think access and dispensing rights um, can be an issue, but maybe that can be overcome by dispensing from the clinics, the community clinics. Um, resources, are there resources that um, need to be sourced or adapted or created, like HIV Connect? And I think the last point on stigma and discrimination, although I've put it last, is certainly very important. Um, that's another 20 minute talk in itself, but that needs to be addressed by education and training. Um, so to end, I think uh, GPs are well trained and able to manage chronic health conditions, including HIV and comorbidities. Uh, Community-based GP care provides equity of access. Um, successful models of GP care can be adapted to suit the local situation, but we need participation of key populations, we need political initiative and will, legislative structure, administrative organisation, clinical education support needs to be in place or adapted, and stigma and discrimination must be addressed. Finally, thank you Dr. Iskander um, for the invitation to, the, uh, to speak to the organising committee, Victoria, and to the IAS Educational Trust.